Good evening, Team SCCA. I'm Mike Cobb, President and CEO of the Sports Car Club of America, and I want to welcome each of you to our 2022 Hall of Fame Award Show. We're so excited to be with you tonight, and we're proud to bring you this special celebration featuring your Sports Car Club of America 2022 Hall of Fame inductees, as well as the 2022 Member of Excellence and Wolf Bernardo uh, Award recipients. Tonight, we'll recognize and celebrate seven of our finest who've made incredible contributions to this great organization and the broader world of motorsports over a combined 250 years of SCCA membership. So round up your friends and family, get the popcorn and your favorite beverages ready, and let's get this multimedia motorsports extravaganza started. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the SCCA 2022 Hall of Fame Award Show. Let's roll. Charlie Clark has been a member of the SCCA since 1973. In those 49 years, Charlie has been a road racer, autocrosser, organizer, mentor, and most importantly, a leader. Charlie's road racing career started in 1976, and his portfolio includes many regional and divisional wins. He has made 33 SCCA National Championship runoff starts with five top 10 finishes. Charlie started as an autocross competitor when it was still called Solo 1 and Solo 2. Charlie is a Solo 1 national champion and a Solo 2, now just called Solo, national champion as well. Most impressively, he is one of the few remaining 100 percenters, those who have attended every Solo national championship event in the program's history. But competition wasn't enough for Charlie. He knew that you had to give back to the organization for it to thrive. In 1981, Charlie partnered with Bill Johnson and Bill Spencer and created a new solo format, Pro Solo, now a wildly successful addition to the SCCA catalog of programs. Charlie served as the Solo Nationals chairman multiple times while it resided in Salina, Kansas, and in the club racing community as a club racing board member. He was elected to the SCCA's board of directors for four terms. And while on the board of directors, Charlie served as one of the liaisons to the rally board, touching yet another SCCA program. Charlie is the 1985 winner of the Solo Cup for contributions to the Solo program and the 2017 Dick Berger Perseverance Award winner. He is the Clark in Solo's Johnson Clark Johnson Pro Solo Series trophy for the season-long champion. Perhaps even more than all his competition and organizational experience with the SCCA, Charlie is incredibly well known as a mentor to road racers, autocrossers, rallyists, and just members in general. Whether it be competition or leadership advice and tasks, his no-nonsense style and willingness to jump in with both feet and get his hands dirty has made him a well-known and exceptionally well-respected member of the SCCA. Charlie will go down in SCCA history as a one-of-a-kind kindred spirit to many other members of this great organization. Fellow SCCA members, we welcome Charlie Clark to the SCCA Hall of Fame. Introducing Charlie is Bill Johnson. I've been asked to introduce Charlie Clark uh, for this award. It's an old saying that uh, you never really know somebody until you've had a heated argument with them. I know Charlie Clark better than anybody else because that's all we've ever done is argue. Usually over a beer. Charlie has been a member for 50 years. This is an honor that he truly deserves. And no matter what I say bad about him, I probably don't mean it. Yeah, I do. <laughs> Uh, Charlie was part of the founding of Pro Solo. He was active to steward of Pro Solo. It would have never happened without him. Uh, he has been on almost every committee in SCCA, held every office in SCCA, known by almost every SCC member. And, uh, anybody ever deserved this award, it would be Charlie. It's a great honor to be here and tell you that I appreciate this honor a lot. 
Uh, I don't know that I deserve it, but I appreciate it. I, uh, I will say the reason that I joined SUCA in the first place was to drive cars. And I, that is what's driven me in the club since it started. And I hope to continue to do that for a short time. Uh, I got interested in, in, the, in 1973 for the first National Solo II. Uh, it was important that I go there because it was a big deal and fun. It has continued to be a big deal and gotten bigger and more fun. And along the way, uh, I got to do some other things in the club. And I found that the great thing about SCCA is that they will let you do anything you want to do if you volunteer. And they give awards for you having fun. And that's got me here. And I've had a great time doing it. And uh, I will say that many of the things that I got to do was because of my friend Bill Johnson. And uh, I, I feel good about being able to be in the same group that he's in. Uh, he showed me how to do things, uh, how to get things done, and uh, who could do them for me. So uh, that and, and trying to drive a car fast, have fun doing it, and help other people do it is what has driven me for 48 years or so, <laughs> however long that was. Uh, I've gotten to do a lot of things that I would not have ever thought about doing. And I've got to go places for the SCCA that, and meet people that are very much fun and very nice and still my friends today. And with that, I'm going to say thanks again. The easy answer to Howard Duncan's legacy is the more than 30 years as the driving force behind the birth and growth of the National Solo Program. But his SCCA legacy goes far deeper than that. But yes, his most visible role was as the leader of the Solo Program, and for good reason. Under his 30-year guidance as an SCCA staff member, the National Solo Program moved into the major leagues by developing high-quality, long-term event sites and building an immense volunteer team. This process has helped the Solo National Championship event grow from 500 entries in the mid-1980s to a record 1,375 entries in 2018. Howard was instrumental in securing and then maintaining SCCA's longest-running partnership with Tire Rack. In addition to their nearly synonymous pairing with SCCA Autocross, Howard and Tire Rack were instrumental in bringing the Tire Rack Street Survival Program to the SCCA, helping teens become safer drivers on the road. In addition to his impact on the solo program, Duncan was a strong supporter of the Rallycross program, especially in its early years, and for the first 10 years was one of just a handful of competitors who had attended each and every Rallycross Nationals. Away from work, Howard's main hobby remains cars. He's been an autocross competitor and rallycross competitor and has been known to get behind the wheel, given the choice most often in a Miata, on a racetrack for track days, time trials, and even the occasional road race. His work has been recognized previously as the 2014 Wolf Bernardo Award winner, unprecedented for an SCCA member who earned the award primarily for his work as a full-time employee. As a staff member, he was one of the originators of the SCCA Hall of Fame, the same Hall of Fame of which he is now a member. Fellow SCCA members, we welcome Howard Duncan to the SCCA Hall of Fame. Introducing Howard is Raleigh Boreen. Good evening. My name is Raleigh Boreen. Tonight I have the honor and the privilege to introduce you to a good friend of mine who is going into the SCCA Hall of Fame, Howard Duncan. If you know Howard, you know when you see him that he'll either be in an SCCA shirt or a Hawaiian shirt. So tonight, I thought it would be appropriate that I wear a Hawaiian shirt. 
I met Howard Duncan in 1985 at the Solo Nationals in Salina, Kansas. It was Howard's first Solo Nationals. We met and we had a great time. In spite of the weather, going from 80 degrees the first day to rain and 40s the last two. That was the first of many times over the years that we have had sessions of what I like to call 20 questions. Howard is known for always asking questions to find out what people are thinking and to bounce his ideas off of people, but he's also a very good listener. 1985 was Howard's first solo nationals, but it was not his first experience with SCCA. He became a member of SCCA in 1981 as a member of the Central Florida region, thinking that he wanted to go road racing. Howard had been driving and officiating autocross events for 10 years and wanted to take that next step as a driver. However, his heart was always in solo, and a year later he helped start the Central Florida Solo Program from humble beginnings of a single event at Sebring with less than 60 entrants, his team of like-minded members grew their program to over 30 events a year by the end of 1986. In 1986, the man of many questions became a member of the Solo Events Board, representing the Southeast Division. He went to his first Pro Solo, also in 1986, and by 1989 he had become an independent contractor managing the Pro Solo program for SCCA. After seeing success with Howard managing the Pro Solo program for SCCA, he was approached about becoming a full-time employee of SCCA in the spring of 1990. In December of 1990, he began his 30-plus year career with SCCA. He's had many job titles over the years, but we can say he has always been the manager of the National Solo Program. In 1992, he was able to add the National Tour Program to the already successful palette of solo programs for SCCA. The National Tour Program was conceived and designed to give local soloists all over the country a view of what the Solo Nationals, the end of the year event, was all about. Well, needless to say, both programs and the Solo Nationals have grown into huge successes under his watchful eye. At the end of 1992, Howard was awarded the Solo Cup, the highest solo award given each year to a person or persons who have significantly helped the SCCA solo program. As Howard was developing the two national programs and the national solo event at the end of the year, he always had an eye on local programs. He was always trying to see what could be done at the local level to encourage people to try solo. He was always aware of the fact that the national solo program was SCCA's HALO program, but the key for long-term success was the health of the local SCCA solo programs. He helped local programs grow, from stopwatches and index cards to very sophisticated systems that today we just take for granted. Over the years, he has used his windshield time to come up with many ideas, such as street touring classes, street mod classes, street tire classes, the cam classes, the National Rally Cross program, and many other ideas. He has been the driving force behind the growth in solo all over the country. He has helped develop a strong group of independent contractors that work for SCCA to help manage the national events all over the country. These people not only manage the national events, but when they went home, they helped make their local programs much better. Our National Solo Championship has grown from just over 400 people in 1985 to pushing 1,300 today because of his leadership. In 2014, Howard was awarded the Wolf Bernardo Award, the highest award a member of the SCCA can achieve, the first time ever that a current SCCA employee had received the award. He absolutely deserved it. Howard is the most respected person in SCCA. He's always been the first one on the site in the morning. He's the hardest working person that you'll ever meet, but he also always has time 
for members. He's always realized that members are the lifeblood of SCCA. If someone has a good time and a good experience, they will come back. His whole life at SCCA has been making sure people have a good feeling about SCCA. He's helped write the rules, manage the rules, and enforce the rules, but has never lost sight of who is the customer, and that is our SCCA members. Howard's pride in execution, persistence, and dedication have helped make SCCA what it is today. It is my distinct pleasure to welcome Howard Duncan into the 2022 SCCA Hall of Fame. Good evening, fellow SCCA members from tropical Florida, where I have returned to my SCCA roots. To explain my more casual appearance than is the norm for such occasions, I will lean on the words of my musical hero and life coach, Jimmy Buffett, changes in latitudes, changes in attitudes, as this shirt represents two of my favorite things, SCCA and boating. Take a little deviation from my script here. Those that have seen me do presentations at the National Convention know that I usually work off of napkins with notes on them. Well, here, because I want to make sure this is right, I'm actually working off the script. So excuse me if I'm not looking directly at you at times. Even after learning of this honor over two months ago, I still find this more than a bit surreal given my role with the Hall of Fame project over the last two decades. Never once did I envision that I would be at center stage, even a virtual stage. I have always viewed the contributions I was making to the club as simply doing my job. Having a significant impact on the club should be expected in my view, especially if you were in a leadership management role for over 30 years. Despite my uncertainty of my worthiness, I accept this honor on behalf of all the project team members I have worked with over the years, as this award is really for all of them. Since my earliest days with the local sports car club and then with SCCA, it was clear to me that very little got done in a club setting without the mobilization and involvement of motivated members functioning as a true team. It has been my privilege to work with many such members over my time at SCCA. While I would like to mention each of these folks for their contributions that have allowed me to be here tonight, that is simply not practical in this setting. Therefore, with apologies in advance for probably overlooking someone, I would like to recognize a few folks that impacted me at key inflection points throughout my SCCA life. I would be remiss if I did not start with the team closest to me, my family. My wife, Lynn, and I will be celebrating 50 years of marriage this year, and during all of that time, she has been supportive and encouraging of my involvement in local clubs, then as an SCCA official, and finally as a member of the SCCA staff. I'm not sure anyone knows this, but she was the one who encouraged me to pursue and accept the challenge of working at the SCCA. I was not at all sure this was for me, as it would mean leaving family and friends behind in Florida, as well as walking away from a secure county job where retirement was just a few short years down the road. To be honest, I was also more than a little bit intimidated by the strong, experienced team in Denver. Nick Craw, Patsy Henry, Doug Reed, Costa Dunias, Terry Bassett, and others. These folks seemed way out of my league. Linda would have none of my self-doubt and basically said, you were made for this and you have been in training for 20 years. They should be intimidated by you. While I never believed that last part, she did convince me to give it a try. I have appreciated the support and tolerance that Linda and our son Jeff have given me over the years with my being away from home 25 plus weekends a year at times, the missed dinners and the missed family functions, and when at home, often being locked in the den on an SCCA conference call. Without their understanding, I could have not lasted all these years or accomplished very much. The fact that Jeff has become such a fine man and a great father, despite my absences and not being much of a role model, is a testament to Linda's skill and patience. Since I have never claimed to be the sharpest knife in the drawer, I have needed to, to have the support of project team members so I can make use of other traits to make up for my lack of intellect. These traits include persistence, studying topics, observing, listening, analyzing, listening some more. This approach allowed me to craft ideas that met strategic goals and involved those needed to make it a reality. 
Over the last two months, I have been doing a fair amount of reflection on how I got to this point and those that either came into my life at an opportune time or were impactful on my thinking or actions. Again, the number of folks I can mention would take far longer than we have this evening. Like many of you, my first interaction with someone in the SCCA was not a particularly good experience, but it ended up being criti critical to my thinking going forward. Someone in our local sports car club encouraged me to go to an SCCA race and work a corner. My buddies were scuba divers, so they were in great demand at the track, but I only got in through doing some demeaning begging. They assigned me to a corner station that was located at a slight bend in the front straight where not much happened. The corner captain was not thrilled to have me there and told me to sit on a stump behind the corner station and don't bother him for the rest of the weekend. So there I sat for the next two days doing nothing. Well, not exactly nothing, as I sat there formulating two thoughts about the experience. One, the corner captain was a jackass, and this was no way to treat a newcomer and a potential member. And two, this was the greatest place ever, being that close to these cool cars. Those two thoughts have informed and motivated me over 50 years, so a big thanks to that corner captain. Ten years later, I finally warmed to the idea of doing something with the SCCA. With the encouragement and support of Randy Pope, Danny Shields, and Dave Welch, I agreed to lead a group of autocrossers to start a solo program for the Central Florida region. In a period of less than four years, we grew the program from only one event to nearly three dozen events per year as well as absorbing most of the local clubs into one cohesive group under the SCCA banner. In the second year of the program, we were able to accomplish something that even larger and more established solo programs would have found daunting, executing a large corporate service event for more than a day or two. We conducted an autocross for three weeks at Daytona Beach during spring break for the introduction of the Dodge Shelby Charger with college students driving the Chargers. I approached Randy Popes about being the event lead and he quickly accepted it as he had just graduated from college and was trying his very best to delay getting a real job where he might have to work in a cubicle. Randy excelled as the leader of the team of CFR volunteers we had assembled. The event went so well that Dodge came back to us the following year for a similar event to launch the Dodge Daytona and ultimately the Dodge Collegiate Challenge, all led by Randy. These events taught me a whole new level of event presentation that I've been trying to replicate for 40 years. Plus, we got to meet Carol Shelby. Additionally, Randy never got a real job or worked in a cubicle as this began his motorsports career. I don't think his parents ever forgave me for calling him. My first solo nationals was in 1985 and I had some hesitancy about attending as I thought these folks might be a bit too serious for me. However, I came away from the event as something of a missionary for the event. Besides the scope of the event, I was surprised by three things. First and foremost, the friendliness of the participants, typ typified by meeting Raleigh Bereen the first night we were there and him going out of his way to welcome us to Salina. Second, the announcing of Hall of Fame inductee Lloyd Loring. And third, and last but not least, the gracious patience of Terry Bassett as an SCCA staff member in answering my battery of questions about the event and SCCA. Apparently, I must have made an impression of sorts with Terry since when a vacancy occurred on the SCB after the event, he suggested that the guy from Tampa that asks all the question, questions should be seriously considered. Being on the SCB for three years was a master's level education in how SCCA works, understanding the dedication of those that serve, and that ideas sometimes need to become, need time to become accepted as a change. The one idea that I might be proudest of that they adopted and have followed for decades is the concept of core values that was introduced to me in a story I heard on NPR on my way to Denver to be interviewed for the job of solo manager. That weekend in Denver, there was an SCB meeting, and after I described the concept, they put aside a large part of their agenda and spent most of the day working through the process to develop the, their strategic plan that has guided them for 30 years. Accepting the job of solo manager was a life-changing decision and put me into contact with so many people that it impacted me over the next 30 plus years. Here are a few I'd like to acknowledge. 
Terry Bassett for having the faith in me for being on the SEB and then as solo manager, as well as being a great role model for team building. Tasha Goodale for being the person that over 16 years took care of the, so many details that brought our ideas to life and for being the friendly face of solo for our members. Over her time with SCCA, she spent went from being a secretary at the beginning who did not even know what the letters SCCA stood for to being a respected director of, the, of an SCCA department. Kathy Barnes and Karen Babb for being exemplary SEB members and unwavering ambassadors of Solo and the club in so many roles. Cindy Jansen for her work with Tasha in making the national tour program a success and later being a tireless workhorse for the national solo program. Paula Baker for her efforts in making timing and scoring a true solo specialty and for giving me confidence as an announcer by being the best audience ever in her true Southern way. Grady and Sandy Wood for their many contributions over the years and making the off hours entertaining and memorable with stories galore. Fred Slick for constantly reminding me that the members come first and to not take myself too seriously. Sue Rathel for her grace and wisdom that could always help me get back on track. Patsy Henry for showing me that it is possible to have a backbone and still maintain the friendship and respect of the members. Dennis Dean for being the perfect role model of an effective leader and helping instill in me the value of strategic thinking. Nick Croft for emphasizing the importance of details and making me aware of there being a bigger SCCA world beyond my little piece of the puzzle. Pete Hilton and Dwayne Rust for their effort in us to establish and maintain the Hall of Fame project, one of my favorite endeavors over the years. The rally cross and road rally leaders and communities for continually and enthusiastically reminding me that smaller programs have a valid place in the SCCA. Roger Johnson for so many things that I could do an entire presentation on his impact on me, from his ability to balance being a top level competitor with being a jovial leader to giving me a chance to be one of his ghost writers for the convention gags and themes and his philosophic guidance on club matters big and small. We did not always agree, but I always respected his approach and thoughts. The recent crew of folks that have made up the national solo field staff team, especially the two core leaders, Tracy Lewis and Robert Christmas. All of these folks have given so much of themselves to make the solo program better for all members. Matt Edmonds for making the national solo program possible and my being able to stay at SCCA with the family for all these years. Your faith in our efforts has sustained us in good times and bad. Mike Cobb and Hayward Wagner, along with the entire current crop of SCCA employees and field staff, for making some of my earlier dreams a reality. While the SCCA may be different going forward, it must evolve to survive, and we seem well positioned to move past my least favorite phrase in SCCA, we have always done it that way. As noted earlier, there are so many more folks I could have mentioned and thanked, so I'll finish up by saying every member I have been in contact with over the last 50 years has had an impact on me and has helped craft my thoughts, approach, and actions. I am indebted to all of you and I accept this honor on your behalf. To finish up, to paraphrase John Lennon at the end of the song, Get Back, I guess with this award, I have passed the audition. Thanks and good evening. Though the teenage version of Paul Fanner hoped otherwise, his lifelong contribution to the SCCA and motorsports was destined to be as its greatest cheerleader and premier news source. Fanner first fell fully in love with the sport in 1969 at an SCCA Trans Am race at Riverside, where whether or not he paid for his admission ticket remains something of a legend. By 1973, he was an SCCA member and was working with local race shops on graphic design. His love of formula car racing led to the formation of Formula Magazine alongside a Formula Ford race car in his Southern California garage. Eventually, he found himself working on Sports Car Magazine, first as the art director in 1978 and then as the editor in 1979. And in 1980, he started a publishing company, publishing Cal Club's Finish Line magazine. 
1984, Fanner's company earned the contract to publish Sports Car Magazine. Over the next 38 years, Sports Car Magazine has been SCCA's premier marketing piece, arriving at homes on schedule with news and features on SCCA members across the country. The magazine has evolved with the times, stripping away dated information like race results that can be accessed online and telling even more of the stories of the people who make up the club. Over the period that Fanner's company has published Sports Car, the club has grown from 20,000 members to 65,000 plus members, and the magazine has been a significant contributor to that growth. When Fanner began Racer Magazine in 1994, SCCA was prominently featured right from the start. The first issue featured coverage of SCCA Pro Racing and Pro Rally, and that continues today on Racer.com, now the premier motorsports website for racing news, SCCA News is featured prominently amongst NASCAR, IMSA, and Formula One. For over 40 years, Paul has brought exposure, enthusiasm, and expertise to SCCA in an area that many had overlooked. His chosen niche in the club has expanded its image, grown its membership, and enhanced the member experience for all, and truly deserves this recognition. While a young Paul Fanner may not have realized his dreams of becoming the champion racing driver of California, he most assuredly did become a champion promoter of the SCCA and motorsports. Fellow SCCA members, we welcome Paul Fanner to the SCCA Hall of Fame. Introducing Paul is former SCCA president, Nick Craw. Relationships in racing are often short-term, sometimes not lasting past the current race or the current season. Multi-year contracts are rare and precious. Any relationship which lasts for four decades across six different SCCA administrations is truly extraordinary and is fully deserving of recognition and praise. The criteria for the SEC Hall of Fame include significant impact on the club and the sport, service to the national organization, advancement of the sport, and bringing recognition to the SEC that inspires enthusiasts to seek out and become members of SECA. In every respect and more, Paul Fanner stands as the prototype for a Hall of Fame member. In 1983, SECA needed to solicit bids for the sports car contract. The previous publisher had done an acceptable but minimal job. So if SECA were to advance some very aggressive membership growth goals, such as doubling the membership, the magazine needed a dramatic repositioning. Instead of merely publishing results, usually very long after the fact, sports car needed to be timely, full of content, and a coffee table piece people would be proud to display. It also needed to qualify as a marketing piece with a reach into the membership. Did I mention that we expected the publisher to fund part of the cost through advertising sales? A tall order indeed. The other bidders were large, stable, and somewhat pedestrian. Safe bets, all with no experience in publishing a magazine with a scale of sports car stood out by comparison as he demonstrated a passion and a visceral understanding of the sport and of our club. A Formula Ford racer, he clearly understood the culture of our racing world. He also displayed a talent for presenting a product artistically. He got the job and we were never disappointed. As they say, the rest is history. Sports car became a solid vehicle to engage membership new and old. It is no coincidence that SECA's membership grew from 23,000 to 66,000. It also became a powerful tool for servicing SECA sponsors and series. Many of SECA's new initiatives were launched through Sports Car, including Spec Racer Ford, the Speed Vision World Challenge, and the Shell Race Truck Series. Unlike its predecessors, Sports Car was never late delivering an amazing 450 consecutive issues on time. Along the way, Paul also founded Racer Magazine and Racer.com, both of which featured SECA content from day one. It gives me great pleasure and pride to present Paul Fenner to you 
as a member of the SCCA Hall of Fame. Wow, that was truly humbling. Without the wise mentoring of SCCA members like Nick Craw, I would not be who I am today. It is truly one of the greatest honors I can imagine to be inducted into the SCCA Hall of Fame, especially in the company of such a great group of 2022 inductees. Congratulations, Charlie Clark, Greg Pickett, Howard Duncan, and Mark Weber. You are all SCCA legends, and it is a privilege to share this special moment with you. Little did I know when I arrived at the gate of Riverside International Raceway early on the morning of October 5th, 1969, that this was the first day of my long SCCA journey to my destiny. I was 15 years old and there with three of my high school pals to witness the SCCA Trans Am race. We also saw some great Cal Club regional races that day. My racing dreams soared as I witnessed my first Formula Ford race, but certainly not my last. What I experienced changed me forever. I dreamed that someday I would become a member of the Sports Car Club of America and that I would race in Formula Ford while working inside the sport. When I graduated from high school, I became part of the creation of Formula Ford Review Magazine, which soon evolved into Formula Magazine. And naturally, SCCA Pro and club racing was central to our coverage. Not long after, I began racing Formula Ford with the help and guidance of SCCA members Jules Williams, who was SCCA's first Formula Ford national race winner, and Paul White, co-founder of Automotive Development and Swift Race Cars. My SCCA driving school instructor was Mike Hall, who today is the managing director of Chip Ganassi Racing Teams. I guess you could say I hit the SCCA jackpot of racing knowledge. In 1977, I was part of the team at Paul Oxman Publishing, and we approached the SCCA to publish Sports Car Magazine. I first served as the art director and later as the editor. My ulterior motive was to drive every SCCA race car I could get my hands on and share the experience with my fellow members, but the truth is, I was not a great magazine editor. So knowing I was unemployable and likely to be fired, I left to start my own company with the encouragement of many who might met in our club. In January 1980, we secured our first contract to publish Finish Line magazine for the Cal Club region. And after numerous attempts, we won the contract to publish Sports Car Magazine for the SCCA, starting with the January 1984 issue. I am proud to say that the current issue is the 450th issue published by our company, now known as Racer Media and Marketing. Now, more than 52 years later, this very long SCCA journey brings us to the moment we now share. I look back in awe and in appreciation to all those SCCA members who mentored me and inspired me along the way. I will start by again mentioning former SCCA President Nick Craw who changed me for the better like few others have, while also transforming our club and the sport beyond. Nick's wisdom and encouragement was key to the launch and success of Racer Magazine and Racer.com. Thanks also to former SCCA President and current CFO Jeff Dannert, as well as SCCA Vice President of Road Racing Eric Prill, for believing in our team and for saving our club during the depths of the Great Recession. Also, a giant thank you to SCCA President and CEO Mike Cobb, who worked tirelessly through the pandemic to ensure our club would survive during these turbulent and unprecedented times. This honor would not be possible without Sports Car's great editors, whom I've been fortunate to work with. Sports Car's current editor, Philip Royal, is possibly the person who should be in the SCCA Hall of Fame in my place. Philip is the opposite of me when it comes to editing, and he is one of the very best and certainly the longest serving editor in the magazine's history. Philip has been involved with 196 issues and served as the editor for 174 of those issues. Unlike me, Philip is also a talented racing driver, having won his class at the 2015 SCCA runoffs. Former sports car editors Richard James, Rich McCormick, Mac Demir, John Zimmerman, Lorna Lyons, and Steve Nicholas set the bar high for all who followed and made the magazine better with each issue. The same can be said for sports car's terrific long-serving art director Ree Tucker and her predecessor Paul Leggett, who continues to create illustrations for the magazine's covers, as he did with the current issue. A special thank you to Racer Media and Marketing's Editor-in-Chief, Lawrence Foster, for his unwavering commitment to excellence in everything we make and do. Kudos also go to our Advertising Director, Raylan Stokes, and our very first Advertising Director, Donna Chamberlain-Fanner. 
Thank you also to our wonderful sports car writers and photographers who bring the stories of SCCA members and events to life. My SCCA life would not have happened without the invaluable guidance and friendship from Bill Sparks, Jeff Swart, Rob Dyson, Chris Dyson, Bill King, Skip Barber, Dan Gurney, Phil Hill, Suzette Catheron, David Loring, Hank Thorpe, Andy Porterfield, Natalie Rice, Bob Schilling, Jason Isley, John Doonan, and John Claggett. Last but not least, thank you to legendary SCCA members Marge Banks, Phil Banks, and my longtime colleague Molly Banks for making me feel like part of our SCCA family from the moment we met so long ago. All of you make me feel incredibly proud to be a member of the Sports Car Club of America, and I will be forever grateful for this honor of a lifetime. There's longevity, and then there's Greg Pickett, who has been nearly synonymous with the Trans Am Championship for five decades. Pickett competed in his first Trans Am race in 1975 at Road America. In the time since, he has racked up numbers and statistics second only to Paul Genelosi in series history. He won the 1978 Category 2 Drivers' Championship and finished second in the Trans Am Championship in 1980 and 1984. And he helped launch Jack Roush's legacy as a Trans Am team owner by being the first driver to win for him in 1985. In his Trans Am career, Pickett has scored victories at not only Sonoma, but Mosport, Road America, Lime Rock, Portland, Mid-Ohio, Brainerd, the Detroit Street Circuit, and others. And no other driver can claim a win in five different decades, including this past season in Trans Am West. And in the early 1990s, his encouragement and support helped the then-young Trans Am Series announcer get his start in actually competing in SCCA club racing. Pickett's is not only a story of longevity as a competitor, but in his dedication to helping the series succeed. Following a dormant spell for the championship after the 2006 season, Pickett helped revive it in 2009. His Muscle Milk brand became the series' title sponsor, and America's longest-running road racing series was born again to great success. Pickett didn't sit idle during Trans Am's down period. Instead, he raced in the American Le Mans series and in the 24 Hours of Le Mans. He twice finished second in the ALMS LMP1 Drivers' Championship and scored two team titles as team owner, proving he could win in any way. Pickett's longevity in and dedication to the Trans Am Series is a story that is yet to reach its conclusion and one that will not likely ever be matched. Fellow SCCA members, we welcome Greg Pickett to the SCCA Hall of Fame. Introducing Greg is John Claggett. Established in 2005, the Sports Car Club of America Hall of Fame records the history of the club through the achievements and accomplishments of its members. I am honored and privileged to be announcing the next inductee. The Greg Pickett story begins in 1975 as Greg enters his first Trans Am race at Road America. His first breakout moment came three years later in 1978 when he drove a Corvette to his first win at Sears Point, his home track, and later that year, he won his first Trans Am title in category two. Greg's plan back then was really simple. Race five years, hang up his helmet, go start a family business. It was all about that plan until racing legends Jack Roush and Bob Riley came knocking on his door with their plan. They wanted him to be the development driver for their brand new Lincoln Mercury Capri factory racing program for Trans Am. Well, Greg couldn't say no. So he did the development, signed a partial racing program with Roush, and then delivered Jack Roush's first professional road racing win in 1984 at Portland. With the Roush Racing legacy successfully launched, Greg decided that he'd go back to building the family business. But it was two years later that in 1986, 
It was now Chevrolet, Protofab Engineering, and Charlie Seelix knocking on his door. And they wanted him to be the development driver for the brand new Camaro being designed to beat Jack Roush. It was a deja vu moment for Pickett, but he decided to go ahead and join the Bowtie Brigade and take on the challenge. And history repeated itself with Pickett taking wins at Brainerd and Mid-Ohio in a partial season effort to successfully launch the Chevrolet Camaro factory works team. Having been instrumental in launching both Chevrolet and Ford efforts, Roush and Protofab efforts, Pickett finally felt fulfilled. And so it was again time to focus on building the family business in energy and supplements. The same passion and drive that led to victory on the racetrack led to success in the business world as well. As Greg built Cytosport and his popular muscle milk brand into global brands. It should be no surprise that when Greg set his mind to something, success followed. Pickett raced on and off as time permitted, claiming podium finishes, victories, and titles along the way. Two more in Trans Am, to be exact. But with the continued blessings of the family business, Pickett embarked on a successful America Le Mans series program for 2007 and 2008. But the Trans Am, his first love, was not far from his heart, and he bought another Trans Am car and continued to pace the field as he did 30 years before. Greg Pickett's illustrious 32 season run to the Hall of Fame includes these accomplishments. He ranks number one all time in Trans Am history in six categories. Top 10 finishes, podium finishes, second place finishes, and third place finishes. But perhaps the mark that will never be broken is the fact that Greg Pickett is the only driver in series history to win a race in six different decades from the 1970s all the way to the 2020s. Pickett's passion and love for the Trans Am series shows no bounds. Greg's Muscle Milk brand became Trans Am title sponsor to support the restart of Trans Am in 2010 after a two year hiatus. And later on the Trans Am series gave its highest award to Pickett, the Bob Anderson Memorial Award, presented to an individual who shares the passion for Trans Am and has demonstrated excellence for over a sustained period of time. My goodness, six decades worth of excellence. I think that says it all. It is my honor to present to you the next inductee into the SCCA Hall of Fame. We call him Mr. Trans Am around here, but Greg Pickett, congratulations. Well, thank you very much, John, for that lovely, lovely introduction. You make me, <laughs> wow. Um, yeah, I'm, well, now I'm in my mid seventies, um, um, officially since I was, I had a birthday of 75 just this week, but I'm still hungry. I'm active and passionate as ever about this wonderful sport, this club, and especially the Trans Am series. Mr. Trans Am, well, I like that, John. Bit overwhelming. I'm so grateful for the nomination, um, let alone your acceptance of me into this SEC Hall of Fame. It's nothing I had ever thought I might be able to accomplish when I think back and remember buying my first little street Camaro. Like John said, I've been racing now for most of six decades, mostly in the Trans Am. I've been privileged to, to notch up, I guess, nearly 50 podium finishes, but it's never gotten easy for me to do a post-race interview without choking up, breaking down, having a little bit of trouble because 
I'm emotional about this. I love it. It is what I, it who, in some, it does, um, uh, it establishes in some respects who I really am. It's been such a big part and such an important part of my life, generally. Um, and all the, and I think about all the people that have worked so hard and so diligently to help me accomplish the success. Some guy smart, a lot smarter than me, a while ago, said that you can accomplish almost anything, but you can't accomplish it by yourself. Uh, and boy, that is true. Um, I'm very, very grateful for this nomination uh, and my acceptance into this SCCA Hall of Fame. I have so many people to think, uh, to thank, to think. That's me, all right. I'm not thinking. Uh, I'll start with my, my dear wife, Penny. She's been my partner in life and uh, for all these many years, um, blessed me with a lovely ch uh, family of four children um, and 12 grandchildren. Uh, I've got lifelong friends and that were my competitors in the past and all of that kind of thing. And um, Penny, just without you, who's Greg Pickett? Uh, you certainly um, uh, wouldn't be getting these kind of accolades, um, th these kind, this kind of an award, and achieve some of these accomplishments without my uh, my lifelong partner and my dear, dear, beloved wife Penny. Um, anyway, so how did it? How did this all begin? How, what got me involved or interested in um, in um, in road racing uh, or something like that? Well, I just heard about that in in the late 60s, I think 67, 68, I think was the first year, uh, they built a new racetrack up at, in Sonoma, California, and they were gonna call it Sears Point International Raceway. Uh, I believe it was new in 1968. Uh, and I had heard that, um, I just came across the fact, I don't know exactly where, maybe I read it in the magazine, that um, they were going to have a Trans-America Championship, a TA race, uh, in 1969 as their first pro race uh, at, um, at their new facility. Um, and in that race uh, was going to be um, all the muscle cars in that era. Um, Roger Penske and his, and his Donahue-driven Sunoco Camaros, uh, the Shelby and Bud Moore uh, Mustang teams, um, uh, driven very capably by champions Cornelia Jones and George Fulmer. Uh, anyway, so I took my son, uh, Michael, and we went up on a beautiful grassy slope uh, at Sears Point and watched a fantastic race. They went at it, you know, uh, particularly Mark and uh, and Parnelli Jones and back and forth with the lead. And at the end, uh, it was Penske and Donahue because of their, their race management. That's nothing new for the Penske organization, right? And their success in that regard. Um, came through and won the race, and I was hooked. I said to myself, Craig, how are you going to talk Penny into letting you buy a 1969 Z28 Camaro? After all, wouldn't Camaro be a, a nice size family car for me and Penny and my three little children? You're kidding, right? <laughs> anyway, then um, midway um, through my second season, um, in September of 1977, um, the Trans Am uh, rolled into Road America for the Elkhart Lake, Wisconsin, uh, Road America Trans Am Championship, where I got my first peak, unforgettable first views of um, the uh, Trans Am Corvette that was out there during practice. I was running around with Peter Gregg a little bit and at least following him and he was very nice to let me do that, uh, at least in practice and he would pull me by four or five car lengths down every street and then what, during one of the practice sessions I glanced up in my rear view mirror and saw a monster big uh, silver, dark silver Corvette. It pulled out, thundered by me on the front straight, gathered up the eight or nine car lengths to Peter on the front straightaway, followed him down to turn uh, turn two onto the back straightaway, and Jerry just pulled out. Jerry Hansen was the was a young fellow who owned it. Um, a, a very good 
club racer, multiple club uh, national champion in, in various Can-Am cars um, that Jerry was famous for campaigning. And um, he had bought this car to do a play around with a little bit. And uh, um, I immediately uh, headed to, uh, to Jerry Hansen's pits, took a look at that car, and spent the next day and a half begging, pleading, Jerry, you got to help me out. I can't touch these Porsches with what I got. I got to have something. I got to have a weapon I can, I can do this with. Help me with that. He, and so he said, you know what, Greg? I'm going to do that. I'll sell you my, I'll sell you, I'll trade you that, um, that, my Corvette, that Greenwood Corvette, that Bob Riley design, remember that name, design Corvette. I have a little bit of money, my mom's had a little bit of money for that Corvette. And uh, that began my first knowing and began my relationship, my long time relationship with my dear friend and the great American race car designer, Bob Riley and now his son Billy that's taken over for him, uh, et cetera. Um, and so I gave him a call. I knew that he would, had been involved and I said, I'm gonna run this car. I plan to run this car next year in 1978 and I've got to, I've got to work, I've got to beat those Porsches somehow. And um, I said, so do you have any ideas for an engine builder? And he said, well, yes, I know this fellow named George Fultz, very good friend of mine. We worked together at Chevy, Racing, in essence, is what it was. In uh, Detroit, he built all the Can-Am engines for years and years uh, for um, uh, the, uh, um, for the McLaren um, um, Can-Am team, um, the uh, great Chaparral uh, team um, uh, for Jim Hall. And um, I gave him a call. And he said, I'd be delighted to do it. And Bob said, would you like to take care of the car a little bit for Greg? I'm, I'm going to go to the, the, I don't know how many races, but a few races and kind of get, Greg's a good guy and he's really going to be appreciative uh, if we'd help him do that. Um, so uh, that's what we did. And uh, I got that big car and I think we went and tested it maybe once and uh, Bob stopped the, and it was at Road Atlanta and we stopped the test early about a half a day through and he had me come in the pits and I said, Bob, what's, what's the matter? He said, we're fast enough. Let's, let's not push our, put it in the trailer. <laughs> How many times have I said that more recently? Like, let's just put this in the trailer. We're, we're fast enough. I've been blessed to be able to say that a few times uh, because I've had a modicum of success. Um, and so we started out, uh, he, Bob would come and help me understand the car and engineer it and Fultz was just a great mechanic and keep the motor running and babysit the transmissions, which I'm supposed to be very careful of. And about halfway through that season in May of 1978, we headed west. We headed west to my home track at Sears Point International Raceway. Um, uh, that, that race will be very memorable to me. Uh, it was the, um, I think the fourth race of the season uh, against the great champion Porsche driver George George Fulmer. Uh, we had a great battle the whole time. I think I followed him. Uh, we know the tail for most of the season, most of the race, uh, and um, I ended up passing him. I think at the last lap and and won the won the race. Uh, my first Trans Am race at my home track in 1978. Big big moment for me. We did pretty good with the car after I had finally gotten used to its awesome power. It's 24 inch wide wheels on the on the back. That's each tire was 24 inches wide, 14 inch wide, big wing on the rear, a monster car, close to a thousand horsepower of uh, 500 inch. We finally got it down to about 430 inches of uh, all aluminum fuel injected Corvette. And we had something for those pushers on the street. We won three races in late 78, back to back to back, uh, that took us to the finale at Mexico City, up in the mile high altitude at Mexico City, uh, where my where the Porsches had the advantage, and I was second to um, to Ludwig Heinrich uh, in Mexico City in 1978, but clinched uh, my first uh, and only national 19. 
78 Trans Am Championship. Um, of course, what did I do then? I needed some money, so I promptly sold that car the next year to a very good friend of mine and retired uh, from racing for, for, I didn't know what it was going to be for the first time, it was the first time then, for about three or four years because I had to go back to work. Um, uh, and so that's what I did. And uh, uh, a few years later, um, I get a call, I'm at my office in California, and I get a phone call from my dear friend Bob Riley, rings me up, and um, he tells me that uh, he and some uh, uh, friends of his and, a, and uh, associates of his um, had gotten a contract from the Ford Motor Company uh, to uh, design and build a new car, uh, a new Ford-based car for the 1984 season. Um, um, and um, so uh, I, um, I say, well, okay, uh, I think so. Um, that was a car, by the way, was complete tube frame car and a small block engine, and really, I think, ushered in the modern era of Trans Am cars. And he said, Greg, it would really be, we've been at Road Atlanta for about uh, four or five days. We've been testing with a very fast, young, open wheel driver that, um, that uh, Ford would like to have drive the car that year. Uh, and, but we're just having a little bit, of, we think that there's more speed in the car and I think he just doesn't have the experience in big cars that we need. And we'd really appreciate it if you'd come uh, and maybe help us uh, shake this thing out a little bit and test it at Road Atlanta. If we send you a ticket, would you come? And I said, sure, I think I can do that. So I, uh, I got on the plane and headed to Road Atlanta, or to uh, Atlanta Airport. Bob was met me at, the, um, uh, at my uh, gate and um, uh, we strolled out to the, um, to the, um, to the curb. Um, where um, uh, he, uh, there was a kind of an old beat up, kind of ratty looking uh, photo common line van. Uh, he slid open at the curb, he slid open the door. I jumped in and slid across. He sat down next to me and then he proceeded, and you have to catch this, he proceeded to introduce me to the fellows that were part of this project and were gonna help, uh, who I was gonna help um, test the car with this day. At, Road Atlanta. So the little relatively diminutive guy that was behind the, the seat in the little Ford van was a fellow named Bob, um, a fellow named Jack Roush. Uh, <laughs> we've all heard a little bit of Jack Roush now. First time I'd ever heard of Jack Roush. He said he's going to be building engines. Um, introduced me to um, uh, a guy named Charlie Selix, which was in the in the co-pilot seat. And uh, hello, Charlie, how are you? And I had heard about Charlie, I think somewhere before, because Charlie was around a bit. And sitting in the back on an orange crate, I honestly believe, was a fellow by the name of Gary Pratt. So just think about that for a second, where I get picked up at the airport and into this little van, taken to the airport for some testing, uh, with the luminaries, motorsports luminaries. Here's Greg Pickett with Charlie Selix, Jack Roush, Gary Pratt, Bob, I mean, Bob, come on. Think about that. Think about the think about the impact those names have had on American road and American racing generally. It was amazing. I decide that I want to um, uh, think about getting back in Trans Am. So um, I called up. Um, I looked around and uh, called uh, Tony Ave and I asked around and they said, "Are these buildings some pretty nice cars? They're just." kind of some slight modification and some updates to just a basic Riley, Scott Riley chassis, Bob Riley chassis, and um, um, uh, you want a Chevy, you want a Mustang? I said, well, I think I'll do a Mustang. And, and uh, so I bought a brand new car from him and uh, um, we got it and uh, we got it in 18 and, uh, and uh, Trans Am was, uh, had initiated, I think it's 17, a West Coast Championship. So you could run 
the local West Coast races, not do the whole thing, and they crown a West Coast champion, and you could win a Trans Am race, even though it was a Trans Am West Coast championship, it can still kind of counted as a West Coast race. And so um, got that car, brought it back, and hired a, a, a dear friend of mine now, uh, um, Stevie Dix, who gotten a little bit more famous recently, uh, and I'll tell you about that in a second. But um, we were fortunate enough to um, win three or four races uh, in that uh, in 18 in that Trans Am, and um, uh, then um, I gave it up again for a year. It took a year off, uh, and uh, and then uh, in 2020 again with Stevie Dix and that little Mustang, uh, we swept the West Coast Championship with. Um, um, with five races, and we also got third in the finale, which was a combination West Coast race at the last race in Texas, um, and uh, I finished that race in um, third overall and first in the West Coast. And remember, we've just slipped another decade; it's now 2020, and so I won a Trans Am race in six my sixth consecutive decade in 2020 in the. Uh, in that little Mustang with a lot of help from my good friend uh, and great mechanic, um, Stevie Dix, helped also by some friends of mine in the, from, the, from the past, uh, a great um, uh, mechanic and builder, uh, Jimmy Dunsford, and just our local guys. We went out and had some fun. And what was really important to me during those years is that my young, my young grandchildren had heard about Grandpa G being a race car driver, but had never had the chance to see Grandpa G the race car driver. And it was a great fun for me in 18 and 20 to compete and win in some of those races um, with my grandchildren uh, in attendance. Um, well, I had to go off to, uh, uh, I loaned Stevie Dix to Chris Dyson last year. And I told Chris, Chris, uh, and I kind of taught Chris, I certainly was, responsible for encouraging him to go Trans Am Racing when he left IMSA. And um, I said, Chris, I'll loan you a guy, and if you make it your mission to finish all the laps, finish all the, do all the races and all the laps in those races, you can be 21 champion. And of course, in the old, well, <laughs> one of our companies, which, uh, um, Chris is a partner of mine in, uh, in his Oldwell CBD Mustang. Um, he won the 21 championship and I'm very, very proud of uh, Stevie Dix. Went to most of those races with him and he had a great organization and smart, smart guys. And um, uh, they ended up pulling out that championship, which um, uh, I know Chris is very meaningful to Chris and won some important races at his home tracks of Lime Rock and uh, Watkins Glen, etc., and uh, I couldn't be I couldn't be happier for him. Uh, so, for the club SCCA, uh, for TA Racing, uh, it's been a very critical and important part of mine and Penny's life, my children's lives. I'm very gratified, uh, and I'm deeply appreciative appreciative of my time to participate um, in in SCCA and capping all of that career off with this nomination and my acceptance uh, into this, the hallowed grounds uh, halls of the SCCA Hall of Fame. Thank you, thank you very much. Deeply appreciated and deeply humbled. Thank you and thanks for listening. Mark Weber just may be the model SCCA member. One of the most recognized photographers in the club, Mark sold his first photo shortly after becoming an SCCA member as a high school student in 1970. That single photograph began a Hall of Fame career as a significant recorder of SCCA history, taking hundreds of thousands of photos of race cars through the years. First sticking near his St. Louis home, Weber eventually became the official SCCA photographer for Trans Am, World Challenge, the SCCA runoffs, and more, expanding his reach to various manufacturers and magazines along the way. His work has appeared in Sports Car Magazine, Racer, Auto Week, Car and Driver, and more, and likely hundreds of Mark Weber photos hang on walls and in garages across the country. 
Following the 2020 runoffs, Mark infamously sold off his camera equipment and retired from taking photographs in a career that spanned exactly 50 years. While that alone likely qualifies Mark as an SCCA Hall of Famer, it's only half of his story. He attended his first SCCA driver school in 1974 and has raced continuously since then without even a single year off. First known for his Austin Healey Sprites in the 1970s, he became a fixture of the production category, first in F production and G production, and often in the same car with an engine swap and weight adjustments. Those little British cars gave way to a Mazda Miata in 2010, though his multiple entries continued with E production in addition to his F production focus. And over the years, as the rules evolved, Weber competed in E, F, G, and H production. In all, Weber has entered more than 600 regional, divisional, and national SCCA races in his career. He began a rise to national prominence with his first entry at the SCCA runoffs in 1982 at Road Atlanta. It was impossible to know at that time that it was the start of 63 runoff starts and counting, easily a record. His stated goal is to continue racing until the 2031 runoffs. Why? His answer is simple. Why not? Though he's never reached the podium of the SCCA runoffs, Weber's best finish came in 2020 at Road America with a fourth place. And the attempt isn't over yet. Fellow SCCA members, we welcome Mark Weber to the SCCA Hall of Fame. Introducing Mark is Eric Prill. Hello. My name is Eric Prill, and I'm very fortunate to be able to talk about my friend, Mark Weber. Mark's passion for cars and racing started in high school. After hitchhiking from St. Louis to Mid-Ohio for the Trans Am race during the summer of 1970, he attended his first club racing event at Mid-America Raceway that October. He went to the St. Louis region meeting a day later to display photographs he'd taken. Regional executive Mel Bogus was writing a story for the competition press, precursor to Auto Week, and he asked Mark if he would submit photos from the weekend. The story ran with a Mark Weber original photograph, paying 17-year-old Mark $15, and a professional motorsports photography career was born. Intrigued by the idea of the American Road Race of Champions, which is now called the Runoffs, and its recent move to Road Atlanta, Mark attended his first runoffs in 1971. Over the next several years, his photography business grew, creating remote darkrooms to process film and make prints at the event. For the next 50 years, Mark served as a visual historian of the event, providing his services to racers, manufacturers, publications, and the club itself. Mark hung up as Nikons in 2020, but he continues to manage a photography team that covers many SCCA events, including the runoffs. After traveling to the runoffs for a few years to take pictures and crew for friends, Mark went through his first SCCA driver school at MAR in a friend's H production Bug Eye Sprite in 1974. That first driver school started one of the most astounding racing careers in SCCA. From 1974 through 2021, Mark has competed in 628 SCCA races as a driver, a number that will continue to grow in 2022. There's really no way to tell if that's a record, but one would be hard pressed to find anyone that's raced more. One indisputable record that Mark holds is the most runoffs race starts in history, currently at 63. Mark's runoffs career started in 1982 when he borrowed a trailer from Dorsey Schrader to tow his G production Sprite behind his mobile photo lab slash van to Road Atlanta. A seminal moment in Mark's driving career happened in 1993. On the final lap of the G production race at the runoffs at Road Atlanta, Mark had a freak mechanical failure while running a career best fifth place. After not seeing the finish line, Mark made the decision to run two classes from that point forward, figuring that if it ever happened again, he'd at least have another crack at it. So Mark bought a couple of F production engines for his Sprite and began running two classes throughout the year. At the mid Ohio era runoffs, he became famous for his sub 30 minute engine changes between sessions. With quick disconnects on all the fluid lines, all he needed was a fan belt threaded through the top of the engine, a metal pole, and a couple of strong backs. The record for fastest motor swap, 23 minutes. 
Speed Vision famously memorialized the process in 2003, filming a vignette that was aired during its live broadcast. That was the same year that Mark raced and photographed the event with a broken leg. It was in the late 1990s that I met Mark. I was a budding motorsports publicist and Mark became my frequent roommate during various SCCA pro racing weekends. During those long days in the press rooms, I learned that Mark was not only an ace photographer and a fellow British car racer, but that he was a veritable encyclopedia of motorsports knowledge. He would frequently offer me a bit of tid, as he would say, providing factual nuggets or tidbits that I could use in my event coverage. So here's a bit of tid about that speed vision feature. Not only did Mark have a broken leg, but he just burned his arm during the engine swap and it sprung a bit of a leak while they were filming, requiring some medical attention. In the late 2000s, both Mark and I were intrigued with the idea of racing something a little bit more modern and maybe with some manufacturer support. In 2010, Mark acquired an F production Miata and I offered to help get it completely refreshed and updated. Mark and I then traded cars for the 2010 season with him driving my Lotus and me driving his Miata. Everything went splendidly until the race where he struggled with gearbox issues and I ultimately crashed that Miata, but we worked it out. Mark's career in the Miata took him to his 500th career race and his 50th runoffs in 2012, a feat he commemorated by running the number 50.0, as you see in the image behind me. In 2019, he was able to run number 60.0 at VIR. It wouldn't surprise anyone to see 70.0 soon. And while he's never quite made it to the podium at the runoffs, he did score a career best fourth just two years ago at Road America in his 61st runoffs race. Mark has completed 1,028 racing laps at the runoffs, 92% of the potential laps for 2,655 miles, or roughly the distance from Miami to Los Angeles. And while the photography and the racing career make him worthy of consideration for the SCCA Hall of Fame, Mark's spirit and passion surely seal the deal. There is nobody that has more fun at race weekends than Mark. There is nobody that wants other people to have as much fun as he does at race weekends than Mark. A few years ago, he started volunteering to help the parking team at the runoffs, serving as a welcoming, friendly face for teams as they arrive to the event. He's considering a run for area director an opportunity to give back to the organization that has given him so much. Mark likes a good quote, and he frequently has a perfect one-liner for a given situation. The back of his car adorns the Branch Ricky quote, luck is the residue of design. When dealing with some personal challenges, he once told me, you've got to hit what's pitched. And of course, there's a racer's favorite, the results don't say how. Many know Mark Weber as a photographer, Many know him as a racer. He's a friend to all that meet him. And now he's an SCCA Hall of Famer. Congratulations, Mark. Hey, President Mike Cobb called me a couple of months ago and said the best part of his job was to inform people that they were gonna go into the SCCA Hall of Fame. Well, he was talking to me. So I, I was pretty overwhelmed at the time and uh, I still am. I'm quite overwhelmed, I'm very humbled. And it's, it's been incredible the last couple of months. I don't do Facebook much, but I did put it on there. And uh, the, the number of congratulatory messages I've got has really shaken me. And so many of them said, well-deserved, that darn near brings me to tears. I, this is something that I really didn't even dream about. But uh, I've been a member of SCCA for over 50 years. I went out to a couple of club races at the local track near St. Louis, Mid-America Raceway. I was instantly hooked. In the summer of 1970, I found the St. Louis Region monthly meeting. I walked in, the meeting room was, it was early and the meeting room was rather empty. And a man walked up to me and said, hi, I'm Bud Davis, can I buy you a beer? At that time, I thought as a 17-year-old, this could be the place to spend the rest of my life. So, and it, it has been a great place to spend the rest of my life. I got another 
I don't know, 20 years to go or so. I'm only 69 years old. So I'm going to race at least another 10 years. So along the way, the same Bud Davis invited me out to the next club race at MAR to, uh, not as a spectator, but to go through, as we call it, the barn where registration was and encouraged me to take pictures because nobody else was doing it. I took a few pictures and a couple people wanted a few pictures and turned into a 50-year career and a great one. My father wanted me to be a dog show photographer. He never understood that I don't have that much interest in photography. It was all about the race cars. After a few years, I met some great people. The Red Ink Racing Team took me under their wing and uh, I started driving. I went to driver school in 1974. We got snowed out the first day, came back a week later, had a very successful school. And that was, I think, about 630 races ago. So that was a great career, still going on. Going to race tomorrow afternoon, beats number 631. And uh, started my photography career. The 2020 runoffs was the 50th runoffs that I photographed and the last. It felt kind of sad, but kind of good. Come home from that race, put the cameras away, sell them a month later. I'm not tempted to go back. But one of the reasons I'm not tempted to go take more photographs is I still get to go to the racetrack and see all my friends. And that's the greatest thing there is. The people in the SCCA have really been good to me. Uh, I've enjoyed them all, almost all. And uh, it's just been a great career in both on the track and next to the track. So this honor sort of icing on a big cake. I love it. I appreciate it. I'm humbled by it. I'm honored to go in with people I know and some I don't. Uh, Bobby Ray Hall and Dorsey Schrader and I have tell stories to each other over the years. Uh, other people like, who doesn't know Roger Penske? I've only talked to him a couple of times. I don't consider him a friend, but hell, a, a, a fellow Hall of Famer? That makes me feel pretty good. So, I'm gonna keep racing, see you at the track, and don't forget that luck is the residue of design. Good evening. It's my honor tonight to help introduce the 2022 Member of Excellence recipient. The Member of Excellence Award is presented annually to the volunteer who shows the greatest commitment to SECA motorsports activities. And as a thank you for their many contributions, the recipient is given the opportunity to attend any motorsport event of their choosing anywhere in the world with an expense cap up to $5,000. With this as context, I'd like to share some background on this year's SECA Member of Excellence. It'll be hard to be brief. There were so many superlatives shared in support of this nomination. It was really hard to narrow these down to just a few, but here goes. This member joined the SCCA in 1972, working FNC and continued up the ladder to become FNC region chief, a position he held for several years. In short order, this individual was elected to the board of directors of his home region where he assumed the role of RE while continuing his FNC administrator responsibilities as well. And based on his stellar performance as an RE, he was reelected. From here, he became Sindiv race contact for both Chicago and BVR regions and served as race control admin as well. Through the ensuing years, he fulfilled the role of competition committee chairman for his region while acting as race chairman admin as well as race chairman for many of the Road America professional and club racing events, including the June sprints and the SCCA Pro Weekends. Moving into the new millennium, this utility player continued to do whatever was needed from serving as office manager to actively working with regions outside and outside clubs to establish one of the more successful track day programs in the SCCA. Specifically, he played an integral role in the creation and launch of Chicago Region's track day program. In 2020, as chair of the Chicago Region Competition Committee, he appointed a subcommittee to focus solely on COVID-19 related items for the upcoming June sprints. The successful running of the June Sprints as a spectator event at Road America was publicly acknowledged in many national media publications as proof that road racing events could be held safely 
and with spectators. Success here facilitated the running of the rest of the Road America 2020 schedule, including events with IndyCar, IMSA, and of course the SCCA National Championship runoffs. Here's a few direct comments from his peers. He's a cornerstone of Syndev. He works with all the regions before and during the seasons, whether it be as the scheduling representative, also known as the chief cat herder, the sounding board for new ideas or working at the track. He's there for all of us. During my two terms as RE, he was my go-to man for whom, from whom I could always count on wise counsel, help with a project and selfless support. He always made time to offer his expertise when requested. Next submission. There are many people that eat, sleep and race and work all things SCCA and he's certainly one of those, but he also works hard so that others can enjoy everything that he's had the opportunity to enjoy. And he never forgets that we're all about having fun with cars. From a new, newer member, I've only known him for seven years, but it's easy to see that he is the center of the Chicago region as he works daily in the support of the region's membership. The Chicago region and the central division would not be as strong as it is without his leadership. Next, I and others have not told him of this nomination because he surely would have said, I don't seek it, which to me is just another reason why he truly deserves it. Perhaps one of the most important aspects of this member is that he can be called on, called, um, that he can be called friend by hundreds of members and as a role model for involvement by those looking to join the club. To sum up this nomination, this member is a role model, a creator of future events, a counselor, a sounding board, a leader, and a friend. He's the true definition of a member of excellence. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my honor to introduce you to our 2022 SCCA Member of Excellence, Mr. George Laws of the Chicago region. Congratulations, George. When Peter J. called to inform me of this award, I was speechless. Later, a myriad of thoughts and words filled my head. Honored, proud, thankful, and energized being among them. Honored for being recognized by our national organization as the person representative of a much larger group of members who contribute to the daily well being and success of SCCA. Proud. I was mentored and befriended by many fellow members who taught me and placed a trust in me to carry on their efforts. To have their friendship and know that trust was upheld makes me proud. Thankful for a lifelong partner, Mary Jane, who paved the path to SCCA and participated beside me. And last, energized. A continuing opportunity to be part of a great group with new experiences and many new friends all just waiting to be discovered to the board of directors and additionally to everyone who helped me along the way and helped make SCCA successful two words thank you I hope to see you soon good evening the Wolf Bernardo award is SCCA's highest recognition and is presented to the member who has made an outstanding long-term contribution to the club. Winners are nominated by the last three recipients of the award and approved by the board of directors. The award is named in honor of Wolf Bernardo, legendary British racing driver, and one of the Bentley boys who were so prominent in European road racing in the 1920s and 30s. It was presented for the first time in 1948 the year of Bernardo's death, to Cameron Argetsinger for his work in founding the road races at Watkins Glen, New York, which began that year. It's been awarded every year since, including a period in the 1990s when it was called the Carl Haas Award. Tonight, we add the 74th name to a list of luminaries that counts among its members, such diverse names as Briggs Cunningham, General Curtis LeMay, Mark Donahue, Burdett Martin, and Oscar Kowaleski. As the most recent prior recipient, it's my honor to present to you tonight this year's winner. Our winner is a lifelong motorsport enthusiast who first got a taste of competition while drag racing mom's car at the local drag strip at age 16. That passion progressed and eventually led to an SCCA Pro Rally license in 1973, 
to compete in that series in one of its heydays. But as, ha as happened for many of us, the demands of raising a family led to an extended hiatus from both competition and the SECA. When family demands lessened, the urge to compete and to be involved brought our winner back to SECA. As a member, as a competitor, as an event organizer, and eventually as a national champion. From there, an appointment to a special lease oversight board followed, culminating with duties as its chairman for six years, where tireless efforts set the stage for the recent upswing in specialty attendance and interest, both by individual members and the entire club. For those efforts, that competition specialty has already bestowed its highest award on our winner, who has also been recognized as an SECA member of excellence. But that doesn't really tell the entire story. Our winner has been at the forefront of Rally Technology, developing several low-cost apps for tablets and phones that emulate clocks, odometers, rally calculators, and rally computers. Our winner has also created apps for event timing and scoring, making it possible to minimize interactions between workers and contestants in the era of COVID. Our winner maintains a website for access to these apps, as well as one which provides general road rally information and support, and has appeared as a presenter for convention and online sessions covering such topics as road rally competition and event creation. Our winner's long-term contribution to the sport has been the development of the RICTA GPS timing and scoring system, which is now used by road rally events nationwide by the SCCA and other clubs, and has been transformational for the sport by revolutionizing rally scoring. It provides instant scoring feedback to the rally competitors, a first of its kind feature. Scores are automatically transmitted to the organizers, greatly speeding the process of determining the winners of the rally. The amount of manpower required to stage a road rally event is greatly reduced as checkpoint workers are no longer required to time the cars at checkpoints. It's as if a road race could be held with no corner workers and only one person in the tower. For these contributions to our sport of road rally and to SCCA, this year's Wolf Bernardo Award winner is Rich Beretta from Kansas region, making this the first time this award has been bestowed upon someone whose principal accomplishments have been exclusively within the SECA road rally community. Well done and congratulations, Rich. Thank you, Dennis. I've had the privilege to attend a half dozen SECA national conventions during my time on the rally board. I know and appreciate the significance of this award. Thank you to the selection committee and others who work behind the scenes for this honor. Please know that it is very much appreciated and it will be cherished. An effort like this timing and scoring system is a large project. Sure, I'm the architect, designer, and Android programmer, but the system wouldn't be what it is today without the contributions of others. My son David performed all the Apple programming and made several key technical recommendations early on in the project. Jim Crittenden from the Milwaukee region extensively tested the system and made many suggestions for uh, improving its applicability across other clubs. Finally, I'd like to thank the many rally masters around the country who've given this system a try and adopted it as their timing and scoring standard. I'm very proud of what we've accomplished. The system is the de facto system for timing and scoring road rally events in the United States. I'm proud that such signature events as the SCCA National Road Rally Series, Michigan's Press On Regardless Rally, and John Buffum's Winter Challenge all use this system. I'm equally proud, however, of the many small clubs and regions who've given this system a try and been able to resurrect their rally programs. Thank you again for this honor. What a great celebration.
On behalf of the SCCA Board of Directors, staff, and SCCA membership at large, I want to congratulate each of our award winners tonight. Our Hall of Fame inductees, Charlie Clark, Howard Duncan, Paul Fanner, Greg Pickett, and Mark Weber. Our Member of Excellence winner, George Laws, and of course our Wolf Bernardo Award winner, Rich Beretta. Each of you have contributed greatly to this organization. We're absolutely blessed to have you as essential elements of the family, the family we call the Sports Car Club of America. Earlier today in the annual meeting and in the general session, we talked about the SECA experience and about how each of us as members have a responsibility to deliver the best version of this possible in service of supporting others and building the overall club. As part of this, we noted that SECA Life is about creating experiences that truly connect, truly connect people with one another, and in doing that, create memorable experiences that last a lifetime. Experiences that create SECA fans across generations. To this end, we say thank you to each award winner tonight for the collective experiences and memories you have created and sewn into the fabric that is the Sports Car Club of America because you have helped create the next generation of SCCA fans. And in closing, I wanna thank all of you for your continued support of the club. Stay safe, stay healthy, and stay connected. I look forward to connecting with you at an SCCA event in the very near future. Good night and God bless. <laughs>